getting YouTube started up here to stream in case we have more than 100 people. There was like 212 signed up, but I opened it up to uh, I opened it up to uh, to more. And sometimes, usually, when you do workshops, free workshops, not everyone shows up. So, uh, any rate, we got the stream going in case we do go over the 100 100 user mark on on this account. So, we'll go ahead and start recording. So I'm recording this as well, so this will be available afterwards. So thanks again, everybody, for joining today. So the title is Pony Networks, Intro to Network Pen Testing. So basically, you know, really to differentiate between web app pen testing and just regular pen testing. Uh, so this is regular pen testing. This is not necessarily Cisco routers and switches type of network. We're talking network attached uh, servers and workstations is what we're referring to here. So a little bit about me, uh, I'm Philip Wiley. I have my CISSP, OSCP and SANS GWAPT certs. I'm the lead curriculum developer at Point3 Federal. I create educational content for the US military. They were using some older educational content which was kind of outdated and not very helpful. So they started an initiative to have more modern uh, education materials, including offensive security. So that's my latest job. I went to work there in September. Uh, prior to that, I was the red team lead at Kimberly Clark. I've been in offensive security for, for a little over eight and a half years, 23 plus years for IT and InfoSec total. September was my 23, an 23 year anniversary in technology and, I, and cyber security. Uh, I'm adjunct professor at Dallas College. I teach ethical hacking and web app pen testing there. This is what got me into doing the conference thing and uh, and starting Pwn School. I'm also the founder of the Pwn School Project. So uh, the Pwn School Project is a a now currently a streaming meetup. We we went to streaming last last year around January of last year because I started streaming my courses at the college. So I started Pwn uh, started you know streaming the the Dallas meetings. And so when COVID hit, we were able to uh, go right into, you know, streaming, didn't miss a beat. It's just, it really works out easier since you don't have to physically set up in a location. Although I do miss miss the uh, physical meetups. It, it, you know, you can meet virtually, but in person sure misses out a lot. And so uh, someone asked what made me consider pen testing I don't know, it's just when I was working in application security, I found out about pen testing. And even prior to application security, I used to get the hacking exposed books. And then Ed Scotus's book, Hack and Counter Hack, and some different things like that. I always wanted to learn how to hack. So once I got laid off in 2012, I'd been working in application security. So I decided to go to work as a pen tester. So yeah, I will make, let me see if I can post that link again for Google document. It's there and I'll put it in Discord as well. So yeah, that's how I kind of got started too. It's just kind of fun. One of the things I've done with my career and it's served me well is I've kind of followed what I was interested in doing. So uh, you know, that was, was interesting to me. So I was kind of learning hacking along the way and pen testing. So then I end up moving into it, making it, making it a career. Okay. So let's see. So currently I, I, you know, mainly my main focus now, our main job is educating and I do still do some freelance red teaming and, uh, and pen testing. So I got a book coming out too. I have a talk called The Pen Tester Blueprint, uh, which I gave two years ago at B-Size DFW is the first time I gave that talk. Okay, thanks for... <laughs> so yeah, that was the first time I gave the talk. I It was originally a, a uh, talk that I usually, originally started out as a first day of the semester lecture and I also uh, did that talk for 
um, you know, first day of school lecture. I did it for some of the other classes there at the college where I was teaching at. Okay. Sorry, people late, late registrations. So anyway, it started out as a, a course lecture and then turned into a conference talk. You know, because one of the things I was seeing as I gave the talk was that, you know, there's a lot of books on pen testing, but there's not a lot of content on becoming a pen tester. So that's what gave me the idea to do the talk. And so I was also in the, a contributor to the Pride by Hackers Red Team Edition. Basically, they interviewed several of us for the, the book. And so fortunately, I was able to get in there. And that's how I got my contract with Wiley Publishing. They reached out to ask, reached out to me, asked me if I was interested in, in writing a book. And I'd had the idea you know, after giving this talk for a while that this is the subject that really needed to be out there. And so I wrote the book. And so I'm also a co-host of the Uncommon Journey podcast with Alyssa Miller and Chloe Mistoggy. Scott knows Chloe. Uh, let's see, so next screen. So uh, I always share this, this screen with my, my class each semester and in my Pentester Blueprint talk in my workshops. I like this quote that I first learned from uh, Spider-Man. Uh, no, no problem, Andrea, we're just kind of getting started. Uh, so uh, Uncle Ben had told Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. So that's one of the quotes I like to share with, with students. Anyone learning ethical hacking, you know, be responsible with it. You know, make sure you're, you know, being ethical when you're, you're learning hacking, you know, ethical hacking, you need to remember the ethical part, because, you know, if you get, if you get a criminal record, you get in trouble, it's hard to find any kind of job. I mean, not only security, also uh, anything in IT. You know, I have a, a a guy, a friend of mine from a gym where I used to work out at. He got in some legal trouble. It was totally outside of outside of IT or anything related to hacking. But due to that felony, it makes it really hard for him to find a job as a programmer. So it, you know, makes it more difficult. So only hack if you got permission. Even better, written permission. People will come around if they know you know how to uh, pen test, then then they will uh, come around and ask you to perform pen tests for them. And so, you know, maybe they want you to hack someone's Facebook. So be careful, that kind of stuff. It could get you in trouble. So I, and uh, this little sticker up here, hacking is not a crime. Brian Mackinich, that is that runs North Texas Cyber Security Group, started this initiative back in 2018 and printed a bunch of stickers for DEF CON and Black Hat and gave them out there. And it was just basically to try to change the negative connotation of hacking because hacking is used for good things. You know, the term hacking originally came out, people that were writing code, people were, were taking different devices and expanding functionality. So it wasn't really necessarily what we see as hacking, but the media grabbed a hold of that. And then so hacking is what they term you know, what they should be saying, uh, you know, cyber criminals, but we want, we're trying to, the, to help get a good name out there. You know, hacking is a necessary uh, skill. You know, it's security researchers are uncovering vulnerabilities that otherwise wouldn't be uncovered without using these type of skills. So when you're, when you're pen testing, you need a good framework and what this is going to do, this is going to, to help you, uh, make sure you're covering everything that need be, needs to be covered during a pen test and helps you provide consistent pen tests. So PTES, the penetration testing execution standard is a really great one for any type of pen testing. And then OWASP is more into your application uh, pen tests. But the, the PTES framework, it was written by Dave Kennedy, Carlos Perez, uh, Joe McRae, uh, John Strand from Black Hills, information security group. So there's a bunch of well-known people from the industry that help write this standard. So they knew there was a way we need to come up with a standard where everyone is doing pen tests properly. So this is a really good standard. It goes through free engagement activities. Uh, we'll tell you what we will pull up a screen here and 
take a look at Kitas real quick. This is a really good, this is really good to learn. And it's one of the things I include in my class. And when we switched our curriculum to the Pentest Plus, then that this is one of the reasons I liked it because there is a lot of good methodology in there. So this is so this is the main page. So you see pre-engagement interactions, intelligence gathering, threat modeling, vulnerability assessment. So we go back to the fact and see here's a list of the people that that helped write the uh, the P-Test standard. Justin Searle, he's from Guardians. He's also a SANS instructor. You also have, uh, let's see, so you see Chris Gates, he was with Lars Consulting. He's no longer there, but uh, Chris Nickerson is the CEO of Lars. So you see all these people, all these people are pretty well known in the industry. So it wasn't just one person's idea, it was several people's idea. So you see, you know, you got SANS instructors in here, people from different consulting companies, uh, someone from IOActive. This is a really well-known boutique pen testing firm as well as Lars. So you had some of the best in the industry helping write the standard. And so you get into the guidelines. So here's like the tools required. So they discuss different operating systems, virtualization, uh, stuff related to your, your wireless pen testing when they get into intelligence gathering, they get into deeper information there. Here's some different rules and laws according to different states. Uh, so this is just a lot of good information. So when you're in your free time, I would just kind of go through there and look through that. As a penetration tester, when you're starting out, you're not gonna be as involved with some of those activities like the pre-engagement activities. Uh, there's gonna be like interviews, you're gonna talk to the the customers or your internal uh, coworkers that are working in the different IT departments to, to scope out this pen test. So you're gonna have scoping meetings, there's different questionnaires. And so they cover questions related to pen testing, web app pen testing. And if you ever wanna do this freelance, then you really wanna get familiar with this because if you're running pen tests on your own, then you're gonna to have to understand how to scope the pen tests, you know, how, how to, to charge for it, and so most most companies are doing that based on hourly rate. So you'll you'll scope the pen test, looking at how many hours that you seem to think it'll it'll take, and you kind of gain that experience over time. You kind of learn, and there's ways to say that you charge like so many hours per IP or something. Once you have so many hours, you know there's different ways for you to estimate that. So so this is very very helpful uh, document for your for your pen tests. So there's a lot of good detail, but we're not going to go into a lot of detail here on that since we're going to focus more on the technical side of things. So back to the PTES methodology, the main things that you know we're going to focus on here is going to be intelligence gathering, uh, vulnerability analysis, and exploitation. Post exploitation is important during the pen test. You know some of these things that you may not be involved in. Uh, as a pen tester, you may not be doing as much on the pre-engagement interactions. If you're working for a company, you're you're on the calls with the customer when they're when they're kicking off the pen test or scoping the pen test. So you may be involved with that. But the areas you're really going to be involved in is from intelligence gathering all the way down to reporting. But in this, we're going to mainly in threat modeling. You'll you'll do that to some extent, but it's not as uh, detailed on like a network pen test. With threat modeling, you're looking at the different threat vectors, how they can be exploited, and you know you're going out and kind of detailing. Okay, this is what I need to focus on. Network pen tests, you know, something has been done so many times, you kind of have a good idea of what what to focus on. So there's not as much effort that goes into there. Now, if you're pen testing an ATM machine, then you really need to go into detail with your threat model. You're wanting to uh, consider the environment that that ATM is in. So if you're like out in East Texas, then out in the middle of nowhere at a convenience store, sitting outside of a convenience store, it's not 24 hours, then that ATM's exposed without security for a certain amount of time. So 
physical security is going to be very important. If this is a, a ATM inside a big city with a high, high traffic around that bank location, and it's inside the, the bank, you know, then you kind of tailor the attacks towards that. So you, you base it on the threat actors and the threat vectors. And so you plan that out. So you're more, you know, if you're building a product, if you were making some kind of uh, network device, then threat, you know, mod, you know, model your, your attacks based on, you know, that particular product. So you want to specialize towards that. Uh, the video will be posted. I'll I will share up in, in Discord because once this downloads and and uh, and finishes processing, I'll put that up. So currently, right now, it's it's uh, being streamed on my YouTube channel, so it's automatically being being recorded. So simplified methodology is intelligence gathering, vulnerability analysis, and exploitation. So. Intelligence gathering is perform is come back here. <laughs> so intelligence gathering is performing reconnaissance against the target to gather as much information as possible to be utilized when you're doing the pen test. So what you're you know the more information you have on a target, the the better chance you're going to have at succeeding on that target. Okay, back. Had someone at the front door. So, uh, so basically, when you're doing a pen test, there's three different types of pen tests, and it's all based on the amount of information you have. So, your black box pen test is more like what an attacker is going to how it's how they're going to approach it. Uh, crystal box or white box pen test is having, you know, login credentials and all that to perform the pen test, and gray box is kind of a a mixture of the two. So you don't have uh, login credentials, but you have IP addresses and all that. So intelligence gathering, you're trying to gather as much information on the target as you can. Um, the more you know about the operating system, the applications running on there, the versions, the better it is, it, better chance you're going to have to hack into it. And then there's open source intelligence. 
Uh, this involves finding and selecting acquiring information from publicly available sources and analyzing it to produce actionable intelligence. So this is especially important if you're doing social engineering, uh, you know, if you're doing a black box pen test, then this is important too, because, you know, you don't have all the information, so you're gonna have to do a lot more digging. And this is all part of the, the P test standard that we mentioned. So you have your passive and the different levels. So passive, you're really not directly connecting and interacting with the target. This is going to like Google, looking stuff up, looking things up on LinkedIn. When you get into your semi-passive, uh, this is like, uh, you know, you're going out and doing like, DNS lookups or whatever, and then you get more into the active information gathering where you're doing uh, in-map scans and, you know, vulnerability scans, and you're actually physically actively interacting with the target, which is just important once you get into the pen test. So vulnerability analysis, so you're doing your port service scan application OS and uh, enumeration. So you're going through trying to collect as much information as you can on that target you're trying to detect your vulnerabilities. So you run your in-map scan, your vulnerability scans using Nessus or Nexpose or OpenVos. And this is gonna collect information on that target. It's gonna give you hopefully your, your operating system, the operating system version and the different uh, applications that are installed. So maybe the, the operating system's patched, but maybe it's running a vulnerable application that can be exploited. So vulnerability analysis, as we kind of mentioned, you're doing your port and service scan using NMAP. Mass scan is another popular one. Uh, Metasploit framework, you can do some auxiliary scanning with that. Uh, it's good for, you know, just as, just as well as the, the NSC scripts, the NMAP scripting engine. You're able to run these different scripts to look for different types of vulnerabilities. So Metasploit, you're able to look for, uh, you know, there's different auxiliary scanners to test for certain types of vulnerabilities, just like uh, the NSC scripts and NMAP. And then the vulnerability scanning use your, using Nessus, Nexpose, and OpenVos. So a lot of people will, you know, that are purists when it comes to hacking, they really think that vulnerability scanning is cheating, but vulnerability scanning helps you find the lo low hanging fruit, which is very important. So you wanna make sure you're able to find you know, there's some vulnerabilities that you can find really easy, and then you got more time to spend on your manual testing and exploitation. So this helps make your work easier and helps speed up what you got to do. Because, you know, on pen test, if you're a consultant, you know, there's a limited time that you have on the pen test. Same thing as a internal resource. And the more time that you have to work on those other items, the better. So, uh, you know, when I worked at US Bank, we had a month to perform a pen test Whereas that same pen test, when I was a consultant, we only had like a week. And so uh, as far as like web application vulnerability, even though you're doing a network pen test, you want to look for any kind of web application vulnerabilities. So there's all sorts of uh, ways that you could possibly get in. And uh, from, you know, from the web perspective, you look at things in OSCP, the labs in OSCP, a lot of the way you, the foothold you get in is through web application vulnerability. So even on network pen tests, you're wanting to do that. So you have your dynamic application security testing, also referred to as DAST. Uh, this is like AppScan, WebInspect, Acunetics, uh, NetSparker, and Arachne. Arachne is a free open source vulnerability scanner. It's, it's good to use a combination of these tools too. So when I'm doing a web app pen test, or if I run across a web application target on a network pen test, then I'll run multiple things. I'll run you know, Burp Suite to do a vulnerability scan, and even OWASP, maybe OWASP will pick something up that it doesn't. And then your open source tools like Nikto, uh, WP Scan, W3F, SQL Map, Durbuster, Derby, and GoBuster. These are good tools. Nikto, I've been able to find things that I wasn't able to find with, uh, with like Nessus or Burp Suite. So using a combination of tools are gonna make you a little more successful on your pen test. And then exploitation, exploit DB is a, a web repository of different exploits. So these are exploits you can download. Some of them are Metasploit vulnerabilities that are uh, also referred to on exploit DB. Searchploit allows you to search for the uh, exploits on a local repository because Kali Linux has exploit DB's files 
contained on the operating system. So you run search exploit and you can look for these different vulnerabilities. So that's that's a really good option. And then Metasploit for, you know, it's not manual, but it's kind of automated, which there is some, some different uh, scripts, like we mentioned that you can detect things with on Metasploit. And with the exploit DB, some of these vulnerabilities uh, are actually, uh, yeah, some there's scripts. So you just download the scripts and there's some of these that are actually just manual actions to exploit. Like there's one uh, FTP vulnerability with a backdoor that I think the username, I think you just use username and then like a semicolon looks like a smiley face to, to access it. You, it makes like it's the smiley face symbol with ASCII characters is what you use to log in with the, the back door. So, okay, network discovery port discovery. So we start with the NMAP scan to discover network ports and services on our targets. The more you know about your target, the better, because we kind of mentioned here, you're trying to get as much information, even though you may have little information, you can come up with enough information that it's like doing a white box or gray box test. So we're going to co cover some of the different commands here. So someone is is bound to ask how much CTFs will help. Yeah, CTFs will, will help a lot. And one of the things too, I'm glad you brought that up uh, because if you're wanting to get a job as a pen tester, there's things that are gonna help, you know, doing CTFs, you, things like hack the box or try hack me is going to, to be better. That's gonna give, that's gonna be better uh, options. But the thing with your CTFs, the company I work for to work for 0.3 uh, federal, our sister company, Point3 Security, they've got a product called Escalate. It's a cyber range or CTF. And actually they're, we're, they're using it here at, uh, at B-Size DFW this year. And what it does is it has these different challenges. So employers use this to, uh, to vet their employees. So when I came to work for Point3, I had to go through their challenge and it's a CTF type challenge. They give you different vulnerable VMs or applications to try to exploit, do reverse engineering. So CTS will help a lot. And a lot of the challenges that companies give you for pre-employment will be more CTF-like. So yeah, CTFs are very helpful. I mean, some of the some of the best people I know at pen testing or ethical hacking do a lot of CTFs, do a lot of hack the box. Uh, someone I know that works at State Farm recently published an exploit that they found on uh, some kind of customer uh, management system, they found this vulnerability and he's constantly doing hack the box. And I forget what his ranking is, but he's over the over the past couple years or so has managed to really get his rank up there. And he's really spending a lot of time in hack the box. So yeah, hack the box, CTFs, you know, building a home lab, downloading vulnerable VMs, all that stuff's going to help. help. Here's some NMAP uh, basics here. So, uh, so the syntax right here, this is going to be this syntax, the dash SV test for service inversion, SC does the default scripts, and this, this can be obtrusive, uh, but it's, uh, what it does is when you're doing your service scan, then the, the, uh, the, the, script for, the script switch will go through and they'll find, okay, if you find something that's SMB, then it's gonna test different SMB things. So it, it's got like default scripts that'll run against the target. And so you can find even more information with that dash capital O, OS detection, dash A for all. So this will set there and do like a combination of several others. So you can, you know, leave out, you know, use less syntax. Dash PN treats all host as online and skips not probing. So sometimes you'll be running an NMAP scan and it'll come back and, and you won't give you results, but it tells you to use this dash PN and it improves your chances. So I always run that by default. Dash I lowercase i, uppercase l is used to scan hosts from a file. So you can take a file to put all your hosts in there. 
because sometimes you may have a pen test and you're doing a full 24 bit subnet mask. So you're able to put the slide, put the CIDR notation in there and scan it. But sometimes there may be hosts on there that the, that the customer is wanting you to avoid. Maybe it's a mainframe and they're, you know, it's an older system. They don't want you to take it down. So you need to exclude that. So be able to scan hosts from a file is a good option because sometimes when you get your scope, it's not a contiguous, you know, subnet. So you've got several hosts in there. So scanning from a file makes it nice because you're able to, you know, if you had a hundred hosts trying to do that all from the command line would be a real chore. Plus you've got that file to go back to and run scans after the fact. So dash lowercase p, this is for ports. So you can scan for specific ports. So like for instance here, they show dash uh, lowercase p 80. So this is for just port 80 HTTP or you can do multiple ports and see we've got it broken out by port 80, 443, and port 8080, or you can do all 60, 60K ports. So this is dash P1, dash 65, 535, or to do all 65K ports, you can do dash P dash. And so this does the same thing. So it's a little less typing. And if I'm doing all 65K ports, I like to do this because if you mistype this 65, 535, then you may miss something. So say like if you cut it one short, you're not scanning all the IP addresses. And sometimes you'll want to scan all IP addresses because, uh, you know, Nmap will sc scan like a default amount of, of IP addresses. It, it, I mean, of uh, ports, it'll scan like the popular ones. So there's something that may get missed. So scanning all ports sometimes is important. Sometimes you may just want to do a basic scan at first to get an idea of uh, what's going on there. And then you can expand it to, to more ports. This will make it a little faster, just doing you know a small uh, amount of ports at first. And then once you see live host, then you can expand your posts. Uh, this dash OA, this outputs to the file. So this gives you the nmap format, what you would see when you're running nmap, the greppable format. So you're able to grep that, that file and easier find stuff by grepping. And then the XML format, the XML, format is very popular for, for pulling into different tools because the Dratus framework is a tool for report writing and collaboration, and it takes XML imports. It'll, some of these, some of these uh, different softwares will use different variations of file formats, but XML is pretty universal. So most of these will take that. And so if you want to run a script, dash script equals, and then the name of the script is, this is the Vuln script. When you're running scripts, you don't have to put this equal sign. I think at one time that was a requirement. So you can put dash script space and then vuln. This is an NSC script to detect vulnerabilities. So you run this, this is like running a vulnerability scanner, only a little bit quicker and, and it gives you a little more detailed information on your findings. So here's some nmap examples. So to scan a single host nmap in the IP address and to do a range of hosts, then you're going to do nmap and then like here, so we got like the IP address dash 254 to give the full range there. And then like a 24 bit subnet, we do the CIDR notation and see how we, we do that there. So, so these are some different options. And also there's the, the list option. Yeah, that's actually this, uh, so it's actually, if you do the equals, it's, it's still dash dash. You can leave the equal or or not. The equal was a requirement, I think, earlier earlier versions, but you can do either one of those. And just the name of the script. So if you go on Nmap site, you can find a lot of different good NSE scripts that are very helpful. And so the previous examples were just simple scans. We did not specify ports or range. So it's, you know, test, 1,000 TCP ports by default, expanding the scan includes all 65K. We can find all the ports and services that might be missed otherwise. And so here's a example. Uh, the following in map is a send scan and set to not probe. So, so we can see this is the in map output we have here. I ran that against a, a, uh, a CTF image that I download off of, downloaded off Vulnhub. I did a article for, uh, the ethical hacking network, and this is some of the some of the content from from that article. So we can see we ran a scan. We see that 
that uh, SSH port is open in HTTP and also gives us like a MAC address of that as well. And so this in-map scan adds a service option. Notice there's more detailed information on this. So you see how we've added the service. We go back and look at this scan. So we're just getting the service, no version. We're getting the state showing the ports open in the port. And we go back here, we're seeing the version. So we're seeing that it's, it's SSH version 7.2p2 and it's running Ubuntu. And then we also have, you know, see that port 80 is Apache web server running 2.4.18. So when you're doing search exploit, you want to search on these particular versions. And so here we're running the, we're using the scripts. So this does the default scripts. And so we're seeing a little more information. So you get the SSH host key here. Uh, we're seeing the robots.txt. So this gives us some information. So there, it's running, you know, since we saw port 80 is running a web service. So we're seeing some, so it says disallowed entries. So there, what robots.txt does is it's a way to keep the, the bots like Google and Bing from indexing certain directories on a website. You don't want to direct, you don't want to uh, actually uh, index all those files because people can file, find that. So you really want to add to your robots.txt just the allowed directories because whenever you do the disallowed, that's showing an attacker or a pen tester. Okay, there's a backup folder that's interesting. There's an admin, an admin area. These should be important. We got root and uploads. So these are good areas that we know to target your attack on. So we see that this is a, a, a sign up in a, in a uh, login form. So this, you see we, the difference in information that we're getting here on each scan. And so that's what you want. You want more information. The more information, the better we're gonna be able to focus our attack. So we know the Apache version, so we can you know, focus our attack on that version. So we can look on exploit DB for vulnerabilities for that. So vulnerability detection and analysis in map scripting engine. So here you see a, another uh, scan and we're showing here uh, a little more detailed information. This has, so you can see some like stuff related to, to you know, CVE numbers off of MITRE. Uh, you're seeing that there's also a, it's vulnerable to slow Loris, which is a denial of service attack. It gives the CVE number. So you can look all this stuff up online. And so when it's testing, it checked to see if it was vulnerable for cross-site scripting and so it couldn't find any DOM-based cross-site scripting. And so you, you can go to exploit DB and we look up this uh, vulnerability for slow Loris. And we look here and it's showing it's a denial of service. And on your pen test, you don't want to do denial of service unless your customer requests that. Uh, you know, vulnerability scanners will detect whether it's vulnerable to denial of service. And so you, that, that's good enough to report on unless they want you to test that. So we can see here, it's a denial of service type, multiple platforms and the author, uh, Snake, he's done a lot of good stuff on cross-site scripting. He had one of the first really good cross-site scripting cheat sheets. And so we see this is uh, slowloris.pl. So we see it's a Perl file. So you have to use Perl to run that exploit. And so we're running search exploit and it's searching the same tool. So that we're able to do this from, from our computer. And where this is gonna be an advantage is so like sometimes you're doing internal pen tests, they won't allow you to get to certain sites on the internet. So they may be blocking exploit DB, which is a good thing because if attackers on a network, they don't want the attacker to be able to pull down exploits. So having this on your, your Kali Linux install Makes it makes it easier to pen test. So if we look at this output here, so we searched on slow Loris. Here's the path to the exploit. So all the exploits from exploit DB is hosted in this folder, and so to get to this particular uh, exploit, then we need to go to this is the the direct directory path off of this exploit DB folder exploits multiple DOS, and then this is the file. So you could run this using the directory path, but what I do a lot of times is I will copy the exploit over like into a project folder or into my documents folder. That way I can work with it. Because if I need to modify that exploit to work on that particular target, 
then I'm not messing up the original copy of that exploit. I've still got the gold copy that's untouched. So you can go through here and pull that down and run that against your target. And so here we run, we're running the, the exploit against that. So we went ahead and just ran the full path. So as I was showing you earlier, that kind of shows you the full path to exploit DB and then the path, the section right here was the path to the direct exploit. So we're running it and this is the, the information that it's sending to the target to profile, to uh, conduct a, a denial of service attack. Okay, so scanning for web application vulnerabilities with Nikto. So here we were scanning that target with Nikto and using different tools, you're gonna to pull different information. So we have some open source vulnerability database numbers for these different types of vulnerabilities. So we see the CSS folder directory indexing found. So this might be interesting. So it kind of points you to things that, that may be useful. Usually if it's not, it usually won't tell you, but this is kind of, and then we see also like we got from our, our in-map scans is an admin page. So we're seeing like a admin login page here. So we're getting information. We see the robots.txt information, the admin area. And so this is also showing some different vulnerabilities here. So we're seeing that it's got some uh, cookie insecurities going on there. It doesn't have the HTTP only flag, anti-click jacking, X-Spring option header is not present. So some of these things like this are usually like lower lower level findings, but sometimes it's it's good to have in there because if you correct all the header insecurities, then it makes your application a little more secure. And so the workshop labs is for Pentester Academy. And so I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. Uh, before we start the labs, let's take a, a five minute break. It is, Four minutes before the hour, we'll start back at one minute after the hour.
Yeah, I see Pony Lover saying, mentioned the Pure Cane Sugar Dr. Pepper. Yeah, that's my, my wife's favorite, actually. Yeah, she's got four Dr. Pepper machines total. We have two upstairs, one in the garage, and then she has has one on loan to a friend of her her stepmoms. Yeah, Paul asked, make sure. Yes. So yeah, Paul, uh, these will be available until they take them down. So now nah, they're they're up there for a while. They actually think thankfully uh Pentester Academy actually put these labs up because uh I was actually talking to them about doing some teaching for them and actually whenever I switched jobs back in September, they were one of the one of the opportunities I was considering. And so they, they, I picked a couple of uh, labs and actually it was on the community. One of the, the CTF ranges or something had set up, it wasn't that stable. So they moved it to the community section for the labs. So these will be available after they've been up. Actually the first place I used it was, was beside San Antonio back in uh, like July, June or July. So what OSINT to tools would you recommend not black box and go blind or go going blind. Uh, so, so like a uh, showdown is a good tool. Whenever I've I've uh, done pen tests before, I did a black box pen test where we only had the physical location because we had to test this specific office, their physical security. So I had to go online, use uh, you know different databases and stuff to pull IP blocks. And when I was doing my test, you know, I was searching for all these IP addresses. I was able to find a, an FTP server in Indonesia that wasn't listed in the IP blocks, but it was like one of their factories somewhere in Indonesia, an FTP server. And I was able to find it through the FTP header. So there's a lot of different tools out there. Like census is another good one out there. Uh, and if, if you, hit, you want to take a good OSINT course, Joe Gray offers a really good OSINT course uh, with depending on, on the type of pen testing you do, the more actual OSINT you have to do, some more black box pen testing, more social engineering you have to use. I mean, like Netcraft is good for looking up the types of servers, like for like web app pen tests or external facing servers. Yeah, Joe Gray. Yep. Yeah, I took his course a couple months back and it was a pretty good course. But yeah, because all the OSINT I've ever done is more related to pen testing and the people finder CTF oriented uh, OSINT classes like he teaches is great. Good to see you joining us, Andrea. I saw you joined earlier, but good to see you on here. Good to see a bunch of familiar names on here. So yeah, that's what I recommend as far as OSINT tools. Also, Alif Davis, Alif Dennis. She teaches some good OSINT courses as well. So Elite, she's actually got one that she did last yesterday at B-Sides uh, Orlando. Yeah, I've heard some really good stuff about Michael Basil's uh, OSINT stuff. Yep, that was it. Yeah, Elite's really, really good, cool person too. So she was doing hers. Uh, her workshop wasn't free, but she was donating the money to uh, all the proceeds to Innocent Lies Foundation. I kind of wished I would have thought about that when I did my workshops. Of course, I would be, they would be low cost because I really don't like to, I don't like to charge for workshops. If it's a company that, was going to want me to train their their employees. I wouldn't have a problem with it, but tra training individuals it's just kind of hard. It's kind of hard for me to do. Sometimes I've had students ask for you know one on one paid you know training, but yeah, I just really don't like to. I really don't like to charge people because I kind of get got into this because you know just kind of a way to give back, and you know depending on the situation, it's kind of hard to charge.
but there's a lot of good free information out there. Let me see what we're at slide wise. So yeah, whenever we go out, so, so if you go to attack defense, you, uh, you need to sign in, sign in with Google. So if you already have a, an account with Pentester Academy, their attack and defense labs, then you can just sign in. And so we're gonna go to the community labs when we get connected. Yeah, thanks for the for sharing that. Tony, I need to do a video of that talk because I gave that at gave that talk at uh, B sides. Uh, Austin last year is the only conference that's selected to talk, but it's interesting because I gave that talk the first time at, at Dallas Hackers Association. And basically the talk I, I do is called reversing education. And so basically all you're doing is you're going out there looking at, you know, say you like the SANS web app pen testing course, but your employer won't pay for it. And you don't want to spend, you know, over $7,000 for a course then you go through and look at the different content on their site and just research it and build out your own case, your own study materials. And it's funny because that's what a lot of instructors do. Uh, Jason Alvarado from, from Dallas College, he used to be my, my uh, supervisor there, but he took a full-time security job and is teaching part-time. But one of the things he said that, yeah, that's what he did a lot of times when he was creating course content. And some other people I know that are kind of senior people in the field and they said, yeah, that's interesting. I do that, but I never thought of it being called that. So yeah, once you go here, you're gonna to go to the community labs. And so here are the two different, two different labs that we're going to use. Let's see what else we got. So the first one and an easy way to detect it is uh, you're going to see this little zebra character here to go in and start it. And so as far as this, this workshop goes, this is the, you can work on these challenges on your own. So you'll have access to all three of those challenges. So we're gonna go ahead and So here's the first one. So once you get signed in there, we're just gonna, okay, we have the account. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign in. So if you, if you hadn't used the TAC and Defense Labs, this is a really, really great resource. It's, they've got, man, they've got over 2000 something, 2000 something labs. And thanks to uh, Pentester Academy for providing that for us. I just refresh and go in there instead of having to go look for that. So we go to community labs. So the little characters they put on there that make it easier to find the particular lab you're looking for a little quickly. But all this stuff that they got there, these community labs, these are all free. These are just open to the public. Uh, Pentester Academy recently started doing some uh, some CTF challenges. So let's see what we got going on here. Oh, okay. So here's the internal network. So we go here and start it. See, they've even got some Docker stuff too. So they've got Docker stuff. If you're interested in, in hardware, they've got some things in there. You can reverse engineer some binaries. And, and so once you get to this page, you've got like a little network diagram. You can choose which data center to connect to. So you know, my recommendation would be pick something closer to your region so you connect a little quicker. So, so select the data center that you want to connect to. But you come here, we can see this is what the, the uh, lab is set up like. So you can see you're the user. So you're going to have your attack Kali Linux system. There are the targets. And so you go through here and it's got the mission. So this is assume breach scenario, meaning you have some credentials. Assume breach is a, a very popular pen test type of uh, 
methodology or approach. Tim Medine's uh, Red Siege, they do a lot of assumed breach scenarios. And it makes sense because you're going through, you're, when you're doing an assumed breach, you're taking all the password cracking and brute forcing out of the picture and seeing what can happen if someone's got credentials. And this is even like, what could an insider do? You know, someone is an internal employee, there's insider threats. Companies will, will you know, or nation states will send people to go to work for companies to go internally work, you know, basically a spy to steal intellectual property they get in, inside the company's environment and then they're trying to get into stuff. So testing internally and testing as an internal employee is what, what you know, really, really good to, to take in consideration and do for pen tests. So here we got like accounts. So you can download the lab manual and this will walk you through what to do there. It shows you the URL and the type network pivoting. And so this takes you through step by step. But as I as mentioned before, it tells you the it, it shows you the, the mission. So you're supposed to this lab is dedicated to you. Okay, so once you click the lab, you have access to a root terminal on Kali Linux. And so to get into to that, we're going to go ahead and run. Yeah, Pony Lover asks, is it better to do walkthroughs or figure stuff out on your own? And I'm gonna say both. When you're starting out and you really haven't done this, okay, so you see how I, it, once it starts, you click the lab link. And so we come in here and we're at a Kali Linux terminal. So this is nice, you don't have to VPN into a network to do this. So yeah, as he, he was asking, is it better to do walkthroughs or do it on your own? So starting out, Walkthroughs are going to be very important. If you get stuck, uh, go through the walkthroughs. Even if you figure it out, go back and look. Google and look at the different walkthroughs because people have different ways of doing things. It's not always straightforward. So looking up walkthroughs are really great. Ipsec is a good YouTube YouTuber to follow. He goes through and hacks a lot of the hack the box uh, boxes. I think maybe even some vulnerable VMs. So. Uh, so yeah, that is a that is very good. It's very helpful. So we see here we do a directory listing. Let's see what this readme file says. Okay, so it says it's not started. So we'd have to to start this. And so this would be if we're going to use like uh, Metasploit, then we're going to need to to, to run that. Okay, we're starting at Postgres, Postgres SQL. So that way we need if we're going to run Metasploit. And so here they've got it set up to let's see tools. So we've got some different tools that they've got set up on there. So this so this makes it easier to find some of the tools. This is kind of the way Backtrack Linux, the predecessor to Kali Linux was, they had like a tools directory with everything in there. So word list, so we're, if you're, there's probably part of the challenge is uh, brute forcing something. Yeah. So here, here's a word list that you'd use for brute forcing.
So we're looking to get our IP address. So you just IP and ADDR. So it was something for me to get used to because if config was what I was used to, to using. I mean, it's probably wasn't, I'm pretty sure that wasn't what we used in Red Hat. I started out Red Hat 97 and use mainly, use mainly use Kali Linux and Ubuntu and recently kind of become a big fan of Parrot OS. So we go back to our lab information. Let me tell you that. So the 192 address is what we're, which is our address. Okay, so this is the this is like our IP address. So let's see if it's got it installed. This net discover command is pretty good. Let's see if I can get. Okay. We're selecting the the device we want to test through. So we're it's, it'll go through in this, and I'm not sure. I don't know if I ran this before, but Net Discover. If you're on that same VLAN, you can run this, and you can discover hosts that way. which is may not produce anything, but this is kind of handy. So if you're like on that local subnet mask, it will bring up uh, that VLAN. It'll bring up the IP addresses of the hosts that discovered and like the MAC addresses. Sometimes it'll pull like information, other information on that. So that's a good way to kind of do network discovery on that. So here we can see they're just running in map against that. So we're just going to run. So they're just run, really running without any syntax. And you have to do what's, you have to look at your specific IP address range. Just go back and maybe. someone asked came asked about the labs so yeah there there's the labs are there's no set end time it's just if pen tester academy pulls those down so there, there's there's no set time limit on it unless they like retire those challenges so i don't don't see it going down anytime soon can you run the gen list if you're on their network that command i'm not familiar with Something tells me that we probably have to use this specific IP from the walkthrough because it, let's see, 210. Is 
this shouldn't be taking that long. One of the things I really like about Pentester Academy is that they try to keep things relatively inexpensive. And when I was talking to Vivek a while back, he he really wants this to be globally affordable to the region you're in. So, you know, $39 a month may not be much in the US, but in India, it may be a lot of money. So he's trying to, he's setting the prices based on the region, which is I think is great. I'm just hitting a V to increase the verbosity on that. Go back and to make sure that I am typing in the IP address right. Okay, I was doing it right the first time. So you want to base that on your IP address subnet. You just seem to be running a little, little slow. Can you VPN to get cheaper prices? <laughs> well, that's, uh, I would say that, yeah, if you did use a VPN, then that would probably work. I'm not <laughs> I'm not, not recommending it though. <laughs> but until I until I used these labs to do this workshop with, I didn't realize all the stuff that they had for free because the because uh, they're community labs and now they've gotten to where they release a CTF. I don't know if it's every week or every few weeks or so, they release a CTF to the public. So it's really, really good. They've been going through and get some venture capital funding to expand their infrastructure. Okay, thanks for sharing that, Sai. So Sai says it's every week. But they come up with some really good stuff and Vivek keeps bringing on some really good people to work there. They just like the red team and the active directory stuff they've got is really good. I've taken those courses. It's separate from Pentester Academy. You can go through and take all the videos related to that course. I think the video content on attacking and defending active directories there, but the labs you don't get. I think that may be the case, but there's a lot of good content on there. Actually, he would uh, shared with me that actually uh, Rasta Mouse is actually was a customer of Pentester Academy or, or still is. Yeah, that'll that'll make it go faster. T dash T four, but I was just trying to follow along with the with the lessons with the, the instructions. And you don't want to go past T four either, because you go to T five or T T six, you may start missing stuff. Yeah, Pony Lover asks, can you figure the figure out the connections of an entire network just via the terminal? Yeah, as long as there's not any network segmentation, you should be able to. In that case, is you just need to know the subnets and and then some of you can just kind of guess at, you know, once you, you can type in different ranges and and guess at it if you don't have all the subnets. And that's kind of what you would do like during a black box pen test.
And as you go through this challenge, you can submit your flags. Yeah, thanks for our recommendation, Scott. We'll Cause I could have typed it in wrong too. Yep, I was using the wrong IP address. Okay, so there it went. So thanks, Scott. Then you can see some some hosts that are actually some live hosts, so you can actually perform individual scans on. So what do we got here? These are kind of limited because I think part of this lab is to try to brute force. We're just going to scan a single host so it goes quicker. Doesn't like that. Okay. There we did all, yep, saw that, that it wasn't permitted. <laughs> so there we've seen still just the single IP, single TCP port open. Yeah, if you really wanna scan stuff quick, do use mass scan, because they claim you can scan I would have to look and see the exact details, but they claim they can scan the whole internet and like, five or six minutes or something like that. But you have to be careful because you can DOS something using it too. So here you can see that the script gave us a little more information on it. <laughs> One hand, how skilled do you have to be to earn the Guy Fox mask? I don't know, I guess if you can 
I guess as long as you got the money to buy one, I guess you can have one. It's the inter interesting thing about about hacking is, you know, to be a true hacker, you should really know how to hack. But it's kind of interesting culture because some people want to claim to be hackers and they don't know how to hack. But <laughs> that's a different story. The search plate system. Oh, yeah, good. If there's any metasploit, any exploits for that particular version, well, it doesn't appear to be. We're barely off, just one one version newer. Okay, I was looking for a specific script that was just for anonymous FTP, but the the uh, default script should have detected that. So I was going to demo that if there was one for it. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to a different lab because I'm going to leave those for you to go through. Don't want to do any spoilers. And this is the, the lab I use for my class. And so we can, can play around with this one. Yeah, so this is the this is the lab I use for my class. So it wasn't completely wasn't completely set up right. So I have to turn off the firewalls to get things to work because this is according to Georgia Weedman's book. 
on pen testing. So we can kind of take you through some stuff with Metasploit. Kind of when you're starting out, some good good uh, VMs to play around with is is like Metasploitable one and two, I mean Metasploitable two and three, because Metasploitable two is Linux and Metasploitable three is when can be installed on Windows. Okay, so actually this is turned off. Just so certain systems in here, they didn't have the firewall set correctly. So dot 15. Yeah, suggestions on note taking for CTFs. Uh, Joplin is a good one to use. Uh, so Joplin is uh, there's like Cherry Tree and Keep Note, which are older, older versions or older note taking tools. But uh, like Joplin, you can go through and and run that. I'll show that in just a little bit and how you could use that. Okay, let's see. So you have to, you have to spell things right. There's not, you have to download the script and it's, uh, pull that up. I'm just going to put Metasploitable in the chat.
That's a good tip. Scott reporting things immediately. And to write up your report as you go along too, because sometimes you kind of miss, you can miss some things. So that's where Metasploitable, I posted that up. Yeah, it's my, only the lab firewall. It's not mine. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things that I need to update in this class. This is the the lab that I have. So you see, this is the the lab set up. So there's like two different Kali machines. Got XP, Ubuntu, Windows Seven, and then Metasploitable on here. And then we have like a firewall between there. And then you've got like a couple systems outside that. In our class, we do a pen test each semester of, of the lab environment. And so I need, need to get something that I can access because I have to have an administrator to make any changes and add stuff. So I've got to, I mean, I may even look at using Try Hack Me because you can set up labs through them. So I may end up setting up some of my class labs through them so I got more control over it. Do you trust Windows Defender on Windows 10? I mean, Windows Defender is actually pretty good. I'm really surprised at how 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 good it is. I typically use something else too, but really I don't even currently I don't have Windows running anything. I've got some VMs that I'm running Windows. My main system is is running Mac OS. My work computer is Ubuntu. My lab machine is Ubuntu. And not to say that those can't be hacked either. I mean, there's malware being written for those. It's just one of the people writing malware is why do you want to target something that that that's not being used that much? Yeah, you can target servers. People are using it for workstations, but Windows, everyone's using Windows. And then from enterprise environments, that's all over the place. So it's a matter of targets because some things, you know, you hear some people say that is easier on, on Linux than Windows. But Windows back in the day used to be severely insecure. So here you can see we just ran a scan against this Windows 7 system. And you can see the different uh, CVEs for it. Uh, all that. So this one's going to be probably, this one's vulnerable to like Eternal Blue. Interesting thing about our labs is every time, every time we reboot the system, when, every, when your lab times out, you lose all the information. It's got something like, like think of a tool called Deep Freeze or something like that. And so what it does is allows you to uh, revert every time. Yeah, Scott says he works for 500 half a million plus person org and they use windows defender so scott you were you're an app sec aren't you or web app pen testing cool thought that's what i remember oh cool that's a good area to be in i bet you're having fun with that so we can like search for like windows 7 exploits. Yeah. Patrick mentioned he's used keep note. Yeah, that hadn't been updated. Cherry tree was kind of the one. It's not the same company, but it kind of took the place of it. Joplin's a really good one. And really where I got 
used to using Keep that was going through the OSCP. Yeah, if someone asks, will the Try Hack Me classes be open to the public? Yeah, I'm honestly, one of the things I'm looking at is my course at, at uh, Dallas College. I used to let people audit, meaning I'd let people take the class for free. They just didn't get credit for the class. And so I've kind of expanded past that. I'm starting a mentorship program. And for that mentorship program, I'm going to start creating a online course, free content. And so I'll be using something like putting the videos on YouTube or something that may have to put it somewhere else because the way YouTube keeps deleting that kind of content. But I plan to put, I'll, I'll open it up to the public. And like the mentorship program may be an application type thing where you sign up for it. Because one of the things I've kind of learned with uh, free stuff is sometimes people don't really take it seriously. Yeah, someone says, do you participate in the holiday hacks? Sometimes I do. The The stuff that they have it through SANS is a lot of fun. It's a lot of really not having much time to do those kind of things. And really, that's kind of one of the things I'm looking forward to in December is to get some time to myself to study. As far as like commercial note taking tools, I actually like Evernote is my is my favorite. But you know, Joplin is good because you can install that on on Linux or Windows or Mac. Okay, so we're going to. So we're going to run this is one of the, the one of the auxiliary modules so we're going to to use this okay so it's saying it's likely vulnerable so we're able to test that it is vulnerable to eternal blue we just have to select which one to use. And one of the things I like about Windows and Yeah, I had a neighbor lock themselves out of the house. That's one of the interesting things about when you do uh, conferences like this, you still have things come up when you're trying to <laughs> trying to do your workshops.
So we can select the payload for our exploit. And if you can pick an interpreter payload, those are usually the best ones to use because they give you more, more options with your shell. Should have been used, should have been set payload. So we just changed that to use that as the exploit. something like Yeah, thanks for that that information, Hema. I noticed a lot of people are starting because even like uh, the Cyber Mentor has put some of his Udemy courses on there. So it's just nice whenever you got labs that you can actually update, you know, because when you got someone that's the person that administers our labs is also teaching too. So they really don't have a lot of time. You know, it's kind of tough for them to get things ch changed quickly when you're, you need to change or update something that's a little faster sometimes when you can do it yourself. But I really like the thing I like about Try Hack Me too is they've really pushed uh, hack the box to be better too. So competition always makes you know people better, and that's even like with tools with with OWASP Zap has has helped Burp Suite to be a better tool. Okay, so we got this exploit running there. It, it failed the first time, but it looks like it happened this time. It won't work this time, so. Should be getting an interpreter. Okay, see, we're there. So, so NT system authority, we can do whatever we want. So you can do change directories in there. When you're doing a pen test, also something you want to do is so here's what you want okay we'll do like who am i that way you can prove to the customer that you what level of access that you gained and then we're going to do like ip config to show the ip address of the system you 
can you do like echo this not host name okay that, that I'm wrong but at any rate that's but you got the IP address you can show what the host the the IP address is and that you're so you ideally want to get that all like in one screenshot because you want evidence of stuff that you've you've been able to get into. What has been my favorite CTF uh, command and control? And actually, I think this is how it's spelled. Yeah, command and control, and actually uh, the group called um, Cybersecurity Nonprofit or CSNP, they've got like an upcoming event and they're using the command and control CTF. I got to use that at Texas Cyber Summit last year and it's mo mostly web-based, but it was a lot of fun. It was a fun CTF. A lot of different conferences use that for the CTF. So you might look for that out there. Okay, so that does our lab demo. So you've got your uh, your labs that that provided by Pentester Academy. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. So so you have those to 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 uh, use on your own. So we have like three different uh, labs there to play around with, and I will send out the PDF of these slides so you can work on that on your own. Here's some different learning resources. Uh, the pen test, pen testing, a hands-on introduction to hacking by Georgia Weedman. That's the book I would start with if you don't have experience with pen testing and then move on to the hackers playbook two and three version two focuses more on red team. So you don't want to skip version two and then the web application hackers handbook, discovering flaws and exploiting uh, the second edition that was created by the creators of burp suite, which they have their web security Academy on port swigger. Now that's, that is uh free to use. It's got labs and content. The operator handbook and red team build manual are good references as well. Some different learning resources out there for good. The top section here are all paid. The lower section are free resources. And there's my, my contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out to me in Discord and, and connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, if you ever have questions, I'm really happy to, to answer before I started teaching, I did a lot of mentoring and helping people out that are trying to get into pen testing. And I still do that today too. That's one of the things I, I like about doing conferences and, and mentoring. So thanks everyone for, for joining. I stopped the recording and now we can open it up to any questions you have. Where am I most active? I'm most active on, I'd say between link, LinkedIn and Twitter, pretty active on both of those. So you can find me at that. I got my, my LinkedIn up there in my Twitter. So both of those, I do a lot and, you know, I follow a lot of good people too. So uh, that's a good, good place to be because InfoSec Twitter. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Like I said, feel free to uh, to uh, reach out to me on uh, on Discord. How do you keep LinkedIn professional? I just don't. I don't put stuff up about religion or politics, just like they tell you to not talk about religion or politics. So I just I just keep stuff, you know, professional. So just stuff out there related to, you know, I like to share about conferences, places I'm speaking at, different workshops and, and trainings that other people are offering. I'll share that, share information from my company. That's the best way to keep it professional. Because if you, if you, you know, one of the things is, you know, everyone's got their opinion, but when you start, you know, getting too opinionated, sometimes that kind of hurts your chances of jobs places. So.
Well, thanks everyone for attending. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. And join us at Pwn School because we have Pwn School coming up soon. We've got Chloe Miss Doggy that's going to the third Thursday of this month. Chloe is going to be talking about burnout. So you have to join us then. So thanks, everyone.